Hey, Karen. Hey, Jessica. Hello. Are you guys? Yeah, I'm all right. Good, good, good. See, Emer oh, Connor is joining us. Hey, Emer. Hey, Jessica. Feel free to turn on your camera there, Jessica, if you feel like it, and get involved in the conversation. Hello. Hello, Emer. How are you? Good, and you? I'm good. Excellent. Good to have you on board for tonight, Emer. So, Kieran and Jessica, Emer is a returner. She's done two or three seasons now over in the States with us. And so, it's always great to have uh, some of our returners come on for the Zoom event because you sort of get to hear, um, I suppose, the story from their mouths, what their experience was like. And you can definitely get involved and ask some more questions, and they'll give you some more of the answers as well. Like with everything, I suppose, here, like all we're hoping to achieve and do is give you enough information. For you to be able to decide, is this really the right thing for you to move forward with and do or not? This isn't by any stretch of the imagination a sales pitch to try and get you to go, okay, I'm going to go do it. It's more like we would much prefer you to find out everything you want to know. And then if it's not for you, thanks but no thanks. And if it is, great, at least you know exactly what you're getting yourself involved in. Is that the same Jessica we've logged in twice or a different Jessica? Oh, it's me again. Sorry. It wouldn't no let me add the camera on at first because my settings were wrong on my phone. No problem. So I'll just, I'll, go I'll just knock out the other one. Uh, so we'll just hang tight for another few seconds, guys, and see if anyone else decides to join us for this evening. Um, Bogdan, as I was saying, we've got Emer here, who is a returner. So Emer's done a couple of seasons already over in the States and is heading back over again in October. And um, So definitely do ask her any questions you want to know or anything you want to find out about life in the States, about the process, about the workload and um, the downtime, all of that kind of stuff as well. And then we're very much going to spend uh, about 45 minutes, maybe an hour max. And as I said, sort of just try and answer any questions you have or give you a little bit more insights into what it is you've applied for. Um, let me start off here while we're waiting for anyone else to join in. Kieran, what stage are you at? Have you applied and completed video clips or... Sorry. I've applied, I've sent all the videos off. Um, I'm literally just waiting for an update now with uh, from the clubs and yep. to uh, with the clubs, yeah. Perfect. So you're out there waiting for an interv interview stage? Uh, yeah. I actually got an update today basically saying that they were waiting on the Florida team to uh, and the US government to get back with them with some information. Yep. And then they would be getting back to me with some maybe some interview dates. The, um, the first interview they were on about was Oaks Country Club. Yeah, so it was myself, Kieran, who sent out the update. Um, oh. So pretty much it's myself who will sort of do all the communicating with you. Um, obviously, I'm the representative here in Ireland that looks after Ireland and the UK. Um, and then I'll say I communicate okay. back and forth with the team in Florida, with the country clubs, um, and sort of be that conduit for both sides to make sure everyone gets the information they need and we can move people through the process as smoothly as possible. Uh, my, my main question was and obviously I understand that some people are from Ireland because that's where he's based and some are from the UK so that is as myself my question was just where would be flying out from so if you live in the UK predominantly flying out from London if you're up more up say the north up towards Scotland then we can fly people out of Glasgow as well but typically London I'm like spot bang in the middle so it doesn't matter either way I'm in Newcastle so so, I, so ideally the most direct flights are London and Dublin and that's typically where we like to get everyone to fly out of, because then we can go Dublin into New York or Atlanta or Boston. And from there straight into Fort Lauderdale or West Palm Beach are the two closest airports in Florida for the country clubs. I have to coming out of where they are. And uh, I was going to say Fort Lauderdale was my, my main guess of where we'd be landing. Yeah, we sort of split them between Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach. It just depends which club you're going to. And then obviously for London, uh, at some of the London flights will go direct into Miami. It depends again which club you're at. And then some of them will do the same through New York or Boston or bump, 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 Washington, and then connect with the Irish team and fly from there into meet your club. So, hello, Nick. Um, so Hi, it's one of, good, good. It's one of the, I suppose, the things that at times we don't sort of maybe touch on enough is that. When you get offered a position and you accept an offer from one of the clubs, you will fly out with your whole team. Now, let's say you're going to, for argument's sake, the Oaks Country Club. They only have a small team because they've been under construction project for the last two years. So at the moment, their team is only 10 people. Typically, their team is about 35 people. Um, but while they're going through this new development of the property, they're down to about 10. And they've, like a lot of clubs, have about seven, possibly eight 
that are still up north in New York or Boston or Chicago for the summer season and will return back down to them again for another winter season. So the Oaks at the moment only had two positions open for interviews. And as it was, they had about six or seven people who were at home in Ireland who'd previously worked with them over the last couple of years that they sort of reach out to first. Um, but then you could be interviewing with a club like Boca West who will bring in anywhere I've between three to four. I've done research on Boca West. I've actually got a couple of people that live in Boca right? and So to be there would be pretty cool because obviously I've got friends that already live there and um, stuff like that. So Boca West, for argument's sake, are probably the biggest country club we deal with. They'll bring anywhere from three to 400 people over every year to join their team um, and get through the summer season. Now, obviously, we recruit out of Ireland, the UK. I've got colleagues in Italy and Portugal, and then the big hub in South Africa. Um, so even when you do secure a place at a club, yes, you'll be flying out with the Irish or the UK team that you'd have had about five or six weeks to sort of get better familiar with, but then you'd be joining up with an international team over there as well. Jessica, what stage are you at? I recently just added my videos on and then I think you replied saying you've uploaded them or they was yep. fine or something. Perfect. I just need to, you know, go on from there really. Yep. So you're at the same stage as Kieran is at the moment, which is good. Oh, that's okay. Yep. Nicole? Yeah, you sent, I sent on my videos and you told me that everything is fine. Like I don't need to change yep. anything. So. so so, so far, everyone's at the same position. What about you, Fatou? Uh, yes, I, I've also uploaded my clips as well. Perfect. So, so everyone's in the same boat at the moment. Um, so that makes it easier. I don't need to go through all the little bits and pieces for tonight with you guys. We can more focus on where are we from here. So as I said in the little update I sent out today, the country clubs and the US government are just probably about a week to 10 days behind where they normally are with us for information. Uh, so it, it's not going to make any real difference to start dates. We're still looking at that end of the first week, the start of the second week of October for people flying over. It just means for us, the interview period is going to be much more condensed. So instead of it being spread out over a full two months, we'll probably squeeze it into six weeks. So it means when the interviews do start, which hopefully will be sometime next week, the interviews will start coming thick and fast. So I would sort of foresee we will probably end up interviewing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday every week, whereas normally we only do Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, so that's how we'll sort of catch up with uh, the little bit of lost time that we're dealing with at the moment. But at the same stage, it is a good opportunity. If you know anybody who potentially might be interested in this, tell them to get their applications in now, get through the process, because ultimately then we could have you interview for the same club, and that person might get to go and work and live with you at the same accommodation and in the same club. So when we do schedule, and it's myself, we'll basically liaise back and forth with you for interviews. So as soon as I get the list from all of the clubs and all the positions, then, as I said, we'll work on the calendar. And what I'll do then is I'll be sending you emails. And in the email will literally be an invitation for a date and a time for an interview with such a club for such a position. And you either click yes, you're accepting or no, you don't. Um, if you click less, you're accepting. It's into a Zoom room. You will go on the day of the interview. I'll be there hosting the Zoom room. And then typically what will happen is you would sort of just sit in the waiting room. And as soon as the interviewers are ready for you, I'll bring you into the interview room. You'll spend 10, 12, 15 minutes max. Um, and then that's it. And that'll be that interview finished. And normally within 24 to 48 hours, I will get the answers from the clubs as to whether they're making you an offer or not. And if they are, then we'll send you an offer letter. And in that offer letter will be, you know, dear Kieran, we're offering you the position of X at club with this for a salary, with this for overtime. This is what you need to start thinking about for uniforms. And basically then from there, once you're happy to accept the offer, we will get you organized in September for securing the police clearance and the medicals and the embassy appointments. So the police clearance is pretty straightforward. If you're in the United Kingdom or Northern Ireland, it is online through a website called ACRO. Um, so don't do it until you've actually signed an offer letter because it does cost £45 sterling. Um, and literally you'll fill in the paperwork, pay the £45 sterling. And within about 10 days, you'll get back a report from them, hopefully saying you've no criminal conviction. That's all we need. You send that to me, we upload it into your profile. And then at the same stage, we'll be providing you with a link for the medical clinic in London or Dublin, 
um, where you can go and attend your medicals. Now, the great thing about the medicals is there's no fasting needed. It's about an hour and a half of a process. It's general health and fitness with the side kicker of a drug screening. So obviously the country clubs all operate at zero tolerance for any drug use. So you just have to make sure, obviously, if you are you know, prone to doing something, you might want to stop. Uh, if you really do want to get forward with this, because if anything flags up on the drug test, that's the offer letter null and void. And obviously then there's no seat on the plane to Florida. Once the medical is complete, it takes about 10 days to two weeks, we get back to your results. And if there is any anomaly something's popped up, both the clinic and myself will obviously discuss it with you. But typically, like there's nothing ever really comes up that if you have made us aware of, should stop you being able to move forward. Um, and predominantly what we use the medical exam for is other than the drug screening is we provide that to the health insurance company to make sure that when you do land over in America, they already have a record of your medical and your health. And then anything that happens from there onwards, they'll cover on the health insurance. And um, so just while we're even discussing the little topic of health insurance, what I always like to sort of mention to people is it will cover all emergencies. It will cover visits to doctors, to hospitals. There's normally about a 75, maybe a hundred dollar um, portion you have to pay in advance if you are going to the doctor or going to a hospital, but everything else gets paid for the health insurance. You do have to cover your own medicine. So if you end up having to come out and get antibiotics or something, you pay for that yourself. And it doesn't cover any dental. And um, so I always recommend again, if you've been offered a position and you're accepting, just go get a dental checkup done. And it's always beneficial because dentist work over in America runs into the tens of thousands of dollars, not a couple of hundred or thousands of dollars. So you definitely don't want to be visiting a dentist over in the States. But then at the same stage, over the years, we've had, you know, silly little accidents like, you know, well, maybe not so silly, but we've had the occasional one where out partying too hard and a bit too much drink taken on board and out by the water and somebody dived in and it was a bit too shallow and they actually broke their neck. Obviously, you're very happy then when you know that you've got everything bar $100 being completely picked up and covered by the health insurance. I think the bill by the end of the time this one guy got out of hospital and was recovered was in the region of twenty five dollars to $30,000. And all he had to pay was 100 Now, thankfully, he made a full recovery. There's no long-lasting injuries. He's good to go. He's back enjoying life again. But it's great to know that if something does happen, it's there, it's covered. And again, we'll walk you through how to use it and what way that works. After all of that part, normally around the third week of September is when we'll start providing you with the paperwork to complete what's called your DS-216, Emer, 219. 160. 160. Um, I've got between J1 programs and H2E programs. I get a bit confused sometimes with the paperwork. But the DS-160 is, again, an online uh, application. And literally, we'll provide you with every piece of information you need, or you'll have it the rest of it yourself, like address, date of birth, passport number, and you just painstakingly fill up the whole application, hit submit, and then you get to book a calendar appointment to attend the embassy on a day and time that suits you, but sort of as soon as possible as well. And at the embassy, you normally do about a 15 to 20 minute interview with the immigration officer. And all they're doing is verifying that you are the person whose picture they see in the passport, and you do know who you're going to work for, what you're going to be doing, how long you're staying for, who's paying for your visa, and the address of where you're working for. They just have to be able to say, I saw this John Fingleton guy, he looked like the passport, he knew what he was up to, we're happy to approve a visa, and then normally within about 10 days, you get your passport back out to you in the post, and about typically anything from 48 hours to a week later, we have you on a plane going to Florida. At that stage, Obviously, as I said, you'll fly with your team. When you land in Florida, you get collected at the airport by our bus. You get brought to the accommodation. You get to settle in. Normally, the first day or two was off, unwind, hang out by the pools, unpack. Um, and then you go into the orientation and training phase. And that's typically the first day or two again in the club. And they show you all around, introduce you to people, show you where the canteens are, the lockers, where the bus picks up, where it drops off set up bank accounts for you, set up social security numbers for you. If you need to get a driver's license, help you with that end of it. So they sort of spend that first two days making sure everything you would need to be able to live in America is set up and sorted out for you. And then after that, it goes into that intensive training period to where they want to make sure that they really have 
given you all the tools, the knowledge, the information, and shown you how they want the job done at their club. Because for argument's sake, contrary to popular belief, a server role or a waitress or waiter position isn't the same in every operation. The general thought process is the same, but how you go about doing it varies from restaurant to restaurant or club to club. So they want you to really make sure you are very, not just confident, but comfortable, and you understand and know exactly where everything is and how to deliver that level of service that their members are expecting. Then you typically spend about a week or 10 days in the buddy system. And for anyone who might be, say, returning to a club that, for argument's sake, Emer is working at, Emer might end up being your buddy because she's done two or three seasons there. And really their role is just to make sure, again, that you've got the opportunity to shadow somebody in your position and for them to shadow you. And eventually for you to be able to say, I'm good to go now. You can leave me alone and stop following me around the place and let me just get out my job. And then it very much focuses on that continuous training, continuous development and seeing, are you somebody who might come back for a second season? Have you got ability to maybe, if you started as an assistant server, move to being a server the next year? Or are you somebody who might move to being a server captain? Do we want to look at different positions for you? Maybe you want to move towards the bar. So they do all that sort of feeling out at the end of the eight months before they then sort of have a conversation about what might be in store for you next October. I will say this, when you land in October, late October, once you get into November, it starts getting really, really, really busy. You will definitely work six days a week, I'd say, from about the second week of this November right through to the end of December. Some weeks you'll work seven days. You'll probably work 10, 12, maybe 14 hour shifts during that six week window because you go from Thanksgiving, which is bigger than Christmas in America, going straight into the festive season. Then you've got Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. And what happens is because all of these members in these country clubs are typically active retired. Their families and all of their families families come to visit. So you go from a house with maybe two members to a house that maybe has 16 guests. And it's like the resorts just become insanely busy with obviously me wanting to show off my club to all of my family who come to visit. So it's like we're at the restaurants, we're at the bars, we're on the golf course, we're at the spa, we're at the tennis course, we're at the clubhouse, we're at the pools, we're back in the restaurants, as opposed to on an average week, we might go up to the clubhouse once or twice for a week. But during those busy periods, we're there all the time because we're entertaining guests. At the end of January, uh, well, sort of the start of January, it winds down. You definitely get some time to chill out. Relax. Some people head off to the Bahamas on little cruises for four or five days. Uh, believe it or not, you can get a cruise to the Bahamas out of Miami for $250, $300. And some people go off to New York, to Vegas the Grand Canyon, whatever it is they want to do. And one of the great things about the country clubs is if you've been that person who's constantly holding up your hand and saying, yep, I'm happy to pick up that extra shift. Yep, I'm happy to help you out and work a bit more overtime. Come January, when you're asking for three or four days off together, they tend to, oh, yeah, that's right. You helped us out all the time. It's now our turn to help you out. Of course, you can have those three or four days off. Um, so it's very much, if you scratch our back, we'll scratch your back mentality when you're over there. But also towards the end of January is when we reach out to you, see, do you fancy going up to New York, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, maybe the Carolinas, and spending May to October working with some of our country clubs up there, doing the same job with the same conditions. If you do, we set up interviews through Zoom at the end of January, the start of February, and all of a sudden, come May, you're relocating maybe up to Cape Cod, up to Rhode Island up to Chicago with your team or with a new team and you're getting to experience working up in one of the Northern clubs for the summer season at the same stage, knowing my country club here in Florida invite me back for another eight months in October. If I want to, some people like to do a couple of seasons. Some people love just doing October to May. I'm coming home every year in May, hanging out with family and friends and going back out again in October. The great thing about it is if you knuckle down and work hard in October, November, December, and January, you have those opportunities. If you don't, and you're sort of somebody that they think isn't out there for the right reasons, as in you're not out there to really try your hardest and to really learn and to be a team member, you typically don't get the recommendation or the referral from your supervisor or that HR manager to the other club who's looking to interview people from their club. So now we're going to take a deep breath and pause there for a second, because I think that's quite a lot of little info we shared with you all there. And I'm curious, has anyone any questions? Hello, Rebecca. No questions? 
and surely somebody has a question on all of that info. Hi. Hey, Rebecca. Sorry, I wasn't able to uh, unmute it for a while. No, you're fine. Feel free to turn on your camera as well if you want to join the party. Um, I might turn on my camera next week. No worries. That's fine. Okay. Has anyone any questions on any of the info I shared so far? Yes, Nicole. Sir, do we get paid weekly or is it monthly? Bi-weekly. Every two weekly. weeks. Okay. Every, every okay. two weeks. Um, yeah. And typically, if if you are all aware or remember the piece about the accommodation and transportation, usually costing between $150 to about $175, you don't mm -hmm. have to pay that when you first arrive. They take that out of that first wage just that they give you after the two weeks work. So literally, when you land in Florida, you have no costs at all until after your first two weeks of work. But remember also, when you land, we're reimbursing you back that $189 for the embassy appointment. And if you are in the UK and you had to spend the 45 sterling on the police clearance, we're reimbursing that back to you as well in that first week's wages. Okay, thank you. No problems. Anyone else? Any other questions for the moment? Sorry. Fatu. Shoot. I wanted to ask, what happens if your interview wasn't successful? Do we get opportunities to do interviews elsewhere? Yeah, so, and, and Rebecca, where are you in the process? Have you got your video clips already submitted? Yeah, I sent my video clips, too. Perfect. So everyone's at the same stage. You're all waiting for me to send you an invite to an interview in the next week or 10 days, which is good. So what will happen is, and this is something for you all to bear in mind, and I'm sure Emer can even attest to this. When you get your first interview and you jump online and you do that first Zoom interview, a couple of things to remember. Even if you're working for the time it's scheduled, because most of these interviews will start at 3 p.m. our time, which is 10 a.m. in Florida, and they might go through till 11 p.m. at night time, which is still only six o'clock in Florida. So let's say I'm scheduled to work that afternoon and John sends me out an invite for an interview. If you can schedule your break for that 15 minute window, step out in your uniform. It doesn't make a difference wherever you need to be. Let us know when you log on, just taking a break from work. It actually is even more impressive for the club that you manage to figure out, to get a little break, to jump out, to do a quick interview and then go back into work to them. And then basically, once I come back and I tell you either yes or no, you've been made an offer normally, They'll make offers to, let's say they're looking for 10 servers. They'll offer 10 servers and they'll put four onto a standby list because they also know over the years we've been doing this, not everyone's going to accept or somebody might pull out at the last minute or fail a drugs test or back out just before they go. So they like to know, well, we've got some alternates that we really liked that are ready to go. So you might be getting an offer or an, or an alternate list, or you might've just got a thanks. No, thanks. It's just not for us. The thing to remember when it's a thanks for no, but no thanks, it's just not for us. There's typically no rhyme or reason. It's not that you did something wrong or you said something wrong. It's a case of they might have had 30 people who interviewed and these just so happen to be the 10 that they just seem to click the best with during that 12 minute conversation. So don't give up hope if you get a couple of no's because you might get one or two no's and then you could get three offers in a row from the next three clubs you speak with. So what I'll do is I'll stay working with you, even if you get a no to the next club that's looking for interviews, the next club that's looking for interviews, the next club that's looking for interviews. And so long as you're happy to stay going through the process, I'll be happy to stay working to try and secure you more interviews until eventually we not just get you an interview, but we get you an interview with a club that you feel like, yes, I would love to work with this club because I just got on with them during the interview. And that's the other thing you have to remember, guys, is now... I'm not saying say no to all the clubs just because you think there might be a better offer coming down the road. All the offers, as in salary and, road and everything, are pretty much the same. There's nothing really changes from that point of view. It's more, did you think I was somebody you would enjoy working with? And if you didn't, that's a reason to maybe say, mm, I don't think so. Or it might be a case of, sorry for one sec, just need to answer somebody who is looking to get in. It might be a case of, I can't remember what I was saying there, sorry, just lost my train of thought. Help, help me out there, Emer. No, you're just saying, you know, like obviously if the club's not for you, but the pay doesn't really difference. Yes. And then you know, the other thing to bear in mind or to, to possibly think about with the country clubs. And again, remember every step of the way, I'm here to ask questions. John, like, what do you think of this club? Do you think is this a good club for me or is it fit? Or I was a bit worried or concerned about this. 
and I'll go back and forth with you until we figure it out. But if you are somebody who likes, say, a smaller community feel, you like to really get to know the people you're working with, you like to, for them to know who you are, you like to be able to recognize faces a lot quicker and be part of something, a smaller club with the likes of the Oaks is a perfect club for that kind of a person. If you are somebody who's used to the big city lights and working in big environments and you're used to loads of different people coming and going and you like to hustle and bustle, you might prefer a bigger club like a Boca West where there's maybe five, six, seven, eight hundred people working at any given time and maybe two or three thousand members around the club. Um, and it's a massive, massive property. So as we go through the interviews, they're the kind of conversations we can have after you've interviewed with them. Um, and you can be saying, no, nah, I don't want to be lost in that kind of a big club. I prefer a smaller one. Um, <laughs> any other questions? So my question is mainly about the visa. So obviously you said how you can um, come off one site to the next going from the winter to the summer program. Is, this, like, is there a time frame on the visa or is it connected with the job? Yeah, so the H2B visa has a life shelf of three years. I thought... Um, yeah, yeah, so the, I, was, I was just making sure like I wasn't yeah. getting anything to happen and maybe renew it with every different club. Yeah, no, so three years is the shelf life for a H2B visa. The initial contract is for eight months. And one of the things we'll brief you on is if you get offered and you accept and you're going to the embassy appointments, the US government has three different layers in um, in their government that deal with visas, and they don't all know exactly what's happening with different parts of the visas. So when you go to the embassy appointments, it's really important that when they ask you how long you're going for, you're staying until the end of May. And that's and it. I'm coming home at the end of May. Because a lot of the immigration officers who conduct the interviews at the embassies don't understand that you can secure an in-country extension and you can actually stay for up to three years on a H2B visa. And when you start saying, well, maybe after May, I might go up to New York or Boston, they go, whoa, you can't do that. You know, I'm giving you a visa for eight months and after that you're coming home uh, yeah. but typically after the eight months our lawyers over in the states put in the paperwork with the US government and we secure what's called an in-country extension and that in-country extension then ties you to the club that has the extension approved by the government that we've just put your paperwork in for and that's how you can go up and work for them for the four months in right. New York, Boston, Chicago and Philadelphia their peak season is May to the end of September. In Florida, it's October to the end of May. So likewise, even if you are absolutely loving life with your country club in Florida and they want you to stay on, at the end of May, your visa is void and you have to go either up to one of the Northern clubs or you have to come home. And then you can go back out again in October and another one. So the H2B visa is what's known as a H2B non-agricultural seasonal work visa. And that's where the seasons become really important for the extensions. Now, one of the things to, to, I suppose, point out about the visas as well is when you're over there on the initial eight months, so from October to May, if you want to, at your own cost or expense, you can come home for an event if the club are okay with it. And you can fly yourself home, you can fly back in, no problems. You literally just go to the airport, they'll see the visa, happy days, you're valid to the end of May, no big deal. After May... If you then decide to transition like Emer did and go work for one of the country clubs up in, say, New York, you can no longer leave the USA without having to go back to the embassy, go through the interview process again, get your extension stamped into your passport, and then head back over to the States. And unfortunately, when you go to the embassy, even if you have your in-country extension, they might very well say, I'm not approving this. You may wait till next October and apply for a new H2B. So we sort of try and recommend to people, if you go over for your very first experience, my recommendation is October to May, no matter how much you love it, come home. And then next October, go over with the mindset of, I'm probably going to stay for two years because I definitely want to go to go up to New York or Boston or Chicago, and I'm more than likely going to come back to Florida. The last thing you want is to sort of get, now you can if you want to, and, and a lot of people do, but you don't want to get so excited about the opportunity to go up to New York and you're up there, and now you realize, shit, it's been a year since I've seen my parents or my family, and I'm sort of stuck, or if I go home, then I can't come back. I have to wait till next October. And so it's sort of, a lot of people would say it's better to do that initial eight-month contract to come home, knowing when I go back out the next time, I'm probably going to be gone for a couple of years. Yeah. And 
to be quite honest, I'm like debating on obviously if you can keep me there. If I do it that way, so I'll take the eight months and then go back for the two years. If you keep me there, isn't it like you have to live there for five years before you can leave and become a citizen and live and work there for five years, something like that? Yeah, but so going down the road of becoming a citizen over there is a long, 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 long. Uh, yeah, I know it's a very long journey. But... Now, we have people, I mean, we, so one of our, I suppose, favourite stories to share is we've got a gentleman who is a GM of a country club in New York who 11 years ago went over as an assistant server, so basically a food runner, and kept working his way up the ladder, kept really overachieving, um, and eventually he hit the country club's went and offered him the opportunity to secure a green card, which would be your next step. And then they can submit the paperwork for a green card, which gets you into management. And then once you get a green card after five years on a green card, you can start the paperwork process for citizenship. But all in all, it's about, if you were to go through the H2, H2B route to citizenship, about 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a long, long process. And not, I would say if we have, Three people every year get towards the H2B or to get towards the green card sponsorship side of it. That's it. Um, and there are people who've already done three years or some four yeah. or five years with a club. So those opportunities are there for sure. But these country clubs don't just offer out promotions because somebody uh, served, I'm not, I'm not, say, a year or two. They really yeah, make people earn it. Yeah. Rebecca, yeah. you had a question for me there, had you? Again? No, I was just saying, I think Rebecca had a question for me as well. No, I don't have a question. Okay, sorry. For that. Jessica. Oh, no, it was, sorry, it was Jessica. Yeah, I was just wondering, do you know, because you go either to London or Dublin for your medical and the embassy, can you do them both on the same day or will that be separate days? Yeah, so what will happen is we, because I understand for a lot of people, even say here in Ireland, like it's pain in the backside to have to travel up to Dublin and back home and back up again and back home again. So if you're organized, we will, when we share the links with you, you literally will book your slot for your medical and you will be looking to book your slot for your embassy appointments. Now, the trick to it is medicals are a lot more easily secured. Embassy appointments can be very tricky because to give you an insight. So this year, the U.S. government have said they will allow 32,000 H2Bs come into America. Now, that's 32,000 H2Bs from all over the world for every industry in America. We're looking to try and secure 1,500 for our country clubs. So when you get the paperwork the same time as every one of those other 30-odd thousand people, everyone hits the embassies at the same time trying to book their appointments. And the calendars for the embassies only have so many slots in a day. So when you get the paperwork and you fill it in and you jump on, my suggestion is always to try and book the quickest appointment you can for your embassy and then look at a medical for the same day. So normally embassy appointments will always happen first thing in the morning. And then you can transition over and do your medical if you if you need to as well. The only slight problem we might run into is the closer we get to the day where we're hoping to get people on planes, the medical could take two weeks for your results to come back. The embassy might only take six days. So we have to sort of balance as well to make sure we don't have you through the embassy and we could have had your medical complete and paperwork back and now we're delayed because then that delays the whole team from flying over and then the clubs get a little bit heaved off. And sometimes we'll say, Do you know what, let's just forget that one person and we'll go with everyone else. So it's something, look, we just sort of work on it together, Jessica. If and when we get to that stage, you and me will communicate and we'll sort of daily see what's happening in if it's going to be a stage where I need you to do the medical, then I'll say, I just need you to get the medical done and then we yeah. can work on the embassy appointment. Okay, do yeah, no problem at all. Any other questions at the minute? No? Okay, Miss Cotter, I'll hand over to you for a few minutes. Can you give them a little bit of a insight into life in the States? Not so, because I think the rest of the process is pretty straightforward, pretty simple. I don't think any of you are really too worried or concerned about the process to getting over there. It's more the, like the even the interview process through Zoom with the clubs, as I said, is 10 to 12 minutes. And it's not so much trying to figure out your level of experience. It's more, you know, where are you at? Where you, might you fit within our operations? And then it's all about personality and attitude. That's it. And so don't be worried about the Zoom interviews. Just be ready to log on and sort of just, that your personality and attitude and 
passion for why you want to go to Florida, be the what shines. What I'd like Emer to do is share what makes it really enjoyable in America and what has you sent home. I mean, I was working in hospitality here in Ireland. Um, I just got bored, to be honest, with COVID and I just looked up how to work outside of Ireland with hospitality. And when like something we did before going over, which was great if you want to kind of make friends and stuff and adjust to the life over there a bit easier. We once we did our interviews and got accepted and stuff, we got added. I'm not sure, John, if you're using Slack against this year, but we had a group chat with our clubs once once everyone's kind of placed and stuff. And we all met up here in Ireland, like a group of 10 of us. We were going to a smaller club at the time um, and then we met up. So we kind of knew each other before getting on the flight and it kind of made that travel a bit easier. It was all our first times. Um, however, you're going to have returners and stuff. Like myself, you know, you are a bit more comfortable going, but there's literally nothing to worry about whatsoever. Um, it does get tough, as John said. There is really, really long days. Um, most of the time, I mean, you're treated great. Um, it's very different to here at home. Uh, you're very organized. There's plenty of staff. You know, you go in every day and you might have a different duty. Like one day you might be just bringing all the bread baskets to a table. Another day, if you're a server, you might be just running food. You might be helping out on the bar if you've bar experience. You know, you they do give you an opportunity to grow. And that's like from the get go. Um, you know, if people are eager, um, your accommodation. Um, luckily, I was placed in the club the first year that the accommodation was owned by the club. So it was that bit cheaper. And, you know, it's great. Like everyone's so close. You know, you don't have to be friends with everyone and come home every day and stay out. But there's always people chilling after work, no matter how late it is. You have your little pool and bonfire and there's loads of community areas you can chill at. Um, you'll always have Wi-Fi. Um, it does get tough being in touch with people at home. Um, I'm quite close with my family, my brother and sister, mom and dad and stuff. And the time difference does make a bit of an impact on that when you come home from work, you know, it, you're tired and you want to just sleep and you want to have your days off just to chill. But um, you certainly get used to it after a while. And, you know, Christmas time comes and some clubs are closed for Christmas Day. So you all make Christmas Day dinner together. And St. Patrick's Day, there's festivals on everywhere. And um, well, but like, it's just everyone's in the same position and you need to remember that, you know, you're trained really, really well. And like a big plus and one of the main reasons I'm going back other than experience is the money as well. And I think most people that are on this program will say that the money is really, really good. And yeah, you work tough days, but it's so rewarding. And other like all other clubs have different um like benefits and you'll have different uh, bonuses on your contract. Um, most workaway clubs have the end of season bonus. So when you are going, if you choose to go up north or you choose to come home, you know, you'll have that extra three grand in your bank account if you complete your whole season. Um, so obviously, if you're going up north, you're not paid for like two weeks because of the travel and stuff and your first paycheck. And um, so I had that extra two, three grand, you know, to keep you going. Or if you want to come home and kind of travel at, with people at home, you know, you have that. Uh, other than that, you have like, like the bonus keeps going up if you return to a club season by se season. You do get a returner's bonus. Um, and then also like the overtime, you can be on like $20, $25 an hour once you hit 40 hours and over. So obviously Christmas, spring break, uh, midterm and stuff. You have those two weeks of you could be working 70 hours in the week and 30 of that is on $25 an hour, which is great and you know what the tax isn't half as much as at home if you are working you're not paying extra tax and um, and you're you operating know, with the taxes you get to declare it back because you're not a resident of the usa so regardless when you come home or you transition up to one of the northern clubs normally around january february time you file your tax returns for the previous year and you will get practically all of it back into your bank account because you're not a u.s resident um, yeah, I so, think the only tax I had to pay that I didn't get back was New York. And even at that, it's just a small percentage every week. But the main tax up there, other than the city tax in New York, was you get your normal Medicare tax and all that back. Yeah. Um, also, like, I mean, you know, you can literally go over if like if you're trying to save and just gain that extra experience and you have that year that you don't know what else how you want to move forward in life and stuff like this is ideal for gap years if you're just finished university 
I was just out of university. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my degree. Um, it wasn't in hospitality, but now, you know, I'm after going down that path and I wouldn't change it. So definitely, like, if you know anyone, if I had my time and I knew what it was like over there, I would have convinced all my friends to come with me. But, you know, it's so great. You don't need your friends. You make, I'm best as friends. Like the people I talk to now every day on my phone are people that I went over with who I never knew when they were from the others or other end of Ireland to me, you know. Um, and all I'm looking forward to now is going back and meeting up with them again that are still over there. So it's it's great. Um. Okay, John is gone. <laughs> Do any of you have any questions for me? They can be brutally honest. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I told John, there's no point of us, you know, uh, making it seem like the most amazing thing ever. Like it does get tough and you c you're not going to get on with everyone, as I always say. And some managers will feel like you're at home and they'll give you a tough time, but they know that you're well able and they know that they have the training to help you to improve and stuff and everything is there for you from transport we used to leave 30 minutes before every day and there was an employee nominated and they get paid to drive us to and from work and um, we used to stop at a 7-eleven and get our coffees on the way um, and then straight into work get dressed and then um, you have split shifts in some clubs but they'll always have a room so we had like little bean bags to sleep on and nap for 30 minutes um, wake up have a coffee go into your evening shift there's a lot of dry cleaners on property as well so we like obviously there's laundry room supply to wherever you're staying but we used to have like a drop off point that you can drop your uniform if you have two days and go back and collect it on your way into work the following day. Uh, but there's nothing you're left short on. You're always near a shop. Um, I mean, you have Publix or Walmart, like five minutes to most accommodations anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, sorry, Chester, what were you going to ask? Um, I was just going to say, which club did you go to? And are you returning to the same club or are you going to try somewhere else? Um, I went to Windsor initially, so that's north of Fort Lauderdale. Um, it's kind of one of the ones on its own. Then Boca, West Palm, there's a lot of clubs kind of in the same region. Um, that's why, like the property owned, like the club owned the property we're staying on it. It was like an old motel turned into apartments. Um, it was a smaller accommodation. Um, I went up north to New York. And then I actually returned to a different club down in Florida. Um, I just wanted to travel, explore. I went to the other coast, to Naples, over by where the Oaks is. Um, so I went there. Um, I'm hoping to maybe get back to Windsor again this year, uh, just for the opportunities of growth. Um, obviously, you know, as a returner, you do have them. You know, you know how it's run. You you know people around you it's nice knowing the members and you'll kind of appreciate that when you get there knowing the members by names it's going to it took me ages at the beginning it was nearly the season over by the time I knew people but you know it's so important to them to some of them you know you get to know them and greet them by their name and that status is important and you're you are going to be working with some really big names and um, the like creator of like the apple ipod and um, a big jewelry company that we all know like all these owners are in the clubs and they're giving you gifts from their companies and you know you like they're just normal people and they treat you like family they'll invite you to work parties in their houses and you're surrounded by all these like big names that you would have seen on tv or heard on the radio and stuff so it does get a bit surreal um, and it can like get even, but it's so enjoyable so i was going to say like even like i've been multiple times over to visit the clubs and sort of try and get over at least once a year and check in and see how everyone's getting on and catch up with the team on site. And, but like, no matter how many times when you get to the gates of these clubs and you drive in, it's like, holy smokes, this is impressive. It's like, wow. And then walking around the clubs, I'm like, man, how hard do I have to work to become a member here? Yeah. Um, it sounds way too good to be true. Like way too good to be true. It is. So here's the thing, Nicole, and, and, and this is why we, so it was only about, three years ago we started doing these nights um, and this is why we bring the returners in as well to talk to people because we are from from day one when we started this we always got the feedback it has to be a scam like there's no yeah. way it has to be. that's like, what that's i thought it was yeah, yeah. And, and that's everyone's opinion at the start and i always say to them 
wait till you're over there working 60 hours a week in these country clubs and you'll see the levels of standards and service that's expected mm -hmm. and you very quickly realize okay it's definitely not a scam and it's definitely mm -hmm. not that it's too good to be true it's just a case of these clubs have hugely high expectations of the levels of service the standards the food and that their members expect and because their members are extremely extremely wealthy and retired they literally have eight months of the year where they are on site 24 7 looking to pass their time looking to be you know catered to looking to enjoy their day they want to go in where people know who they are and talk to them and know that they're a little bit special and a little bit maybe above the average person you might meet around the street and stuff but at the same stage they want you to have a great experience and like for them one of the things they always sort of look out for is they love hearing their team talking about how great their club is and especially when they're outside of the club because then they get because a lot of these clubs are so close together there is that bit of bragging rights like our club's better than your club and this kind of stuff goes on and they know that the majority of that comes from the people working at the clubs so they really do make sure that yes we expect a lot yes we demand a lot Yes, we've got very high expectations of how you serve us and take care of us, but we want you to enjoy working here as well, because if you don't, you sure as hell won't come back for another season. And then we have to get to know new people again, which is a pain in the backside. We would prefer to see the same people come back year after year, because then we get to catch up and go, oh, my, where were you? Oh, no way, you're up in Rhode Island. What was that club like? I almost joined there. And they get to have to catch up with you and sort of, you know, be a part of your life as much as you are a part of their life. Um, however, one or two little things to touch on as well is when you get through this whole process and you're over in Florida and you finished your training and you finished your buddy stage and now you're working in your bar or restaurant or the kitchen or whatever your role is and you sort of think it's okay to go out and party hard tonight and sure I'll rock up tomorrow with a bit of a hangover and I'll just get through it so I will. The clubs will very quickly remind you, remember that orientation we went through and all that training? We said to you, like, it's not okay to come into work tired. It's not okay to be late for work. It's not okay to come in hungover. Like, that's not acceptable here. And if you do it, we sort of have a very simple process where we go, that's strike one. And the next time we talk to you here at the HR office, that's strike two. And all we'll do the second time is remind you that when we see you the next time, it's to give you a plane ticket for your flight that departs at 5 p.m. and you're gone. And the third time, there's no talking about it. It's like orientation was when we explained everything to you and you showed us you understood everything and you showed us you know how to do the job. Every time you don't do the job after that, it's because you just don't want to or you just couldn't care enough to do it. And to them, that's not acceptable. And that's where option one, when you get brought in to meet them or they talk to you about it, that's about the only time you have to actually have a conversation about it, to learn from it, to voice your side of it, and to either get things right or not, because the next time they've already got to a stage where they're just waiting for the third occasion. And then it's like, pack your bags, the driver will pick you up in a couple of hours, you're out of here. And it's not like they tell you today for departing on Monday, they tell you today for departing this evening. And then it's a very quick home pack into a car. And before you even know it, you're trying to message me going, I've been sent home. And I'm like, it's too late. Like there's nothing we can do at this stage. Tickets and everything are booked. You're out of here. So what I always try and suggest to people is pay attention to the rules, pay attention to the regulations, pay attention to the what you can and what you can't do. And remember, not like here in Europe, they're not saying it to you as a suggestion. They're making sure you understand that this is what they will enforce and they will enforce it. Uh, at the same stage, remember, you have a complete support structure, as in you've got a team in Florida who are there to support you. You've got me to support you and my team. You'll have a team in your club, all your HR there to support you. And everyone wants you to genuinely have a great experience and really deliver that level of service that you know you're able to to their members. So nobody wants you to have a bad experience and be sent home for the wrong reasons. But what they won't tolerate is people who just don't want to learn or just don't want to be part of the team or think it's okay to come into work late and hung over and blow off shifts because they party too hard. When you decide you want to go out and blow off steam and party hard, a bit like I will even do at certain times throughout the season, I do it when I'm not working the next morning. You know, so be smart about when you decide to tie one on and party hard 
and make sure it's when you're not on and early the next day. The other thing that they have zero tolerance for, and again, it boils into getting your second or your first or your third strike, is any drama, any late night noise complaints at the apartments. So you have to remember where you're where these apartments are that we've secured for you, typically three and a half to four thousand dollars a month is what the rent costs for these apartments, and then the bills and utilities on top of it, and then the transportation to and from work. So the little one hundred and fifty or one hundred and seventy five dollars for the um, year deduction of it is a small percentage to pay for these apartments. But these apartments are also in communities where you've got families living, you've other business professionals, you've people from the local area, and this is their home. So they don't appreciate it when every year the international teams arrive and they decide to go crazy and party till 12, 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning out by the pool or on the balconies. And I'm there in my apartment trying to put my kids to sleep going, what the bloody hell? And I, because I've lived there year in, year out, I really don't bother engaging with you. I just call the cops. And in America, the cops come straight away and everybody at that house or everybody by that pool will typically get a fine and then the club will be reported about it and then the club will be on to you the next day saying, uh, well, hell no, that's not going to be accepted because the bigger problem is they will eventually kick the club out of the apartment complex. And then like everywhere around the world, we're finding it harder and harder to find apartments because most were being bought up. So the clubs can't afford to be kicked out of a complex because the team decided to party late and cause noise complaints. So just make sure whatever you do when you're out socializing and having a good night out, leave the party at the bar or the restaurant or the nightclub. Do not bring it back home to the apartments because you will get a noise complaint and you will be one step closer to being on a plane home. And it would be a shame to see either eight months or a couple of years of an experience in the States ruined because you came home drunk and were just causing too much noise. Anyone, any questions on any of that or thoughts or concerns or anything else to, anyone yeah. wants to ask? I used to think all this noise and stuff was like when you were telling us before going over, you wouldn't think it's actually real, but the cops are there straight away um, and they'll take names of everyone. And, you know, you don't want to be called into the um, GM's office the next morning. And I've seen it happen, people. Um, and I've seen people my season sent home. So it does happen. They do turn up at your door, the GM of your apartment, like to your apartment door that morning, you're dying hungover and you're not going to work. You're going to a flight. So it does actually happen. But if you're doing everything right and working hard, you can definitely enjoy yourself. And, you know, you might finish at three o'clock one day and you can go out for happy hour somewhere, you know. Um, but no, it's it's just all respect. You're all grown up. You have to have common sense. And that's what it plays into. Like it's really, as I said, it's just a case of, like I, so I've spent obviously a lot of years working in the hospitality industry here in Europe as well. And like, I've been a manager and because we're always so short staffed, somebody will come into work tired or a bit late or a bit hungover and as pissed off as I am, I'm like, I can't afford to send you home because then I'm even more short staffed. And how are we going to get through today's business? So here in Europe, we tend to turn a bit of a blind eye to you. We give out to you about it, but that's sort of it. Over in America, they're like, no. It's just not accepted. You can go home. Somebody else is picking up your shift for today. The They're going to enjoy the overtime and you can consider that one of your strikes. And um, so just when they go through all the rules and regulations, just really pay attention and understand they are rules that will be enforced. Anyone else have any other questions or? No? Cool. So if no one's any other questions, I'm going to leave it there for this evening, guys. We're going to have this, as I said, every week, every Thursday at eight. Feel free to jump in if you want, catch up and see what's going on and stuff. As soon as I get that list for the clubs that are interviewing and we're ready, I will start emailing you with interviews. And then, as I said, we will take it from there. Once you do get that offer letter and you're accepting, as Emer said, we'll bring you to an app called Slack that we use or Pumble, either one. They're basically a messaging platform. Um, and in there, then you'll be in with your club and you'll get to meet all your new teammates. And then we still have these Zooms every Thursday to get you prepared and ready for all the steps that go from being offered and accepted to on a plane. And um, so it's sort of like, it's a weekly process um, and just feel free to stay engaged and stay involved. And at least then you know what's happening. I will ask one more question, which was, what was the name of that site for the police check? It's not for now, it's just the when I need it. So when you need it, I'll send it to you. And basically what will happen is I'll send you the link and the instructions of what to do. All right.
Anyone else anything for the moment? Everyone's happy? All right, boys and girls, Emer, appreciate you joining us. As I said, if anyone has any questions or any thoughts or concerns or worries about stuff, you know where I am, shoot me an email and I will get in touch with you. Otherwise, I'll either see you next Thursday or we'll be in touch to schedule those interviews.